Mm. Okay, so today's uh, talk is by Sean Roberts, who's a PhD student here. Um, he was born and grew up in Cardiff, and he went to a Welsh medium school um, and is bilingual. Um, he came to Edinburgh in 2004 to study um, artificial intelligence and linguistics, stayed on to do the really good master's course in evolution of language and cognition, and is now currently doing a PhD in evolutionary approaches to bilingualism under Simon Kirby, Kenny Smith, and Ange Antonella Sarasi um, in, in your third year. Um, yeah, you can find out a little bit more about his work, um, and he blogs on topics such as evolutionary approaches to bilingualism, code switching, and language acquisition at Replicated Typo. Did I creep you well enough there? Yes. <laughs> find that out? Okay. Um, tonight's talk will focus on his PhD project of how studies of bilingualism and language evolution can inform each other, mainly asking the question, is there an evolutionary explanation to how children can learn two languages simultaneously? Thank you. Thanks, um, This is the most prestigious talk I've ever given. So I'm incredibly <laughs> nervous. Uh, it's really nice to be here and get a chance to, to talk to you. Most people, because uh, these kind of lectures are actual proper professors, real researchers. Um, uh, and so, like, all, all the stuff I'm doing is sort of developing very rapidly. So the description that I gave about what I was going to talk about actually changed once I tried to do a talk about it. Uh, and now I'm going to do, do uh, this talk. And so the title, mainly, um, is when, when you're a PhD student, you realize that the three years isn't a very long time to have a lot of new ideas. But you go to conferences, and you have to submit papers, and you do talks and poster sessions. And what you, you put all that on your CV, and then what you really want is for all the titles to be very different, mm -hmm. even though they're essentially the same subject. So there's only so many ways you can combine bilingualism and language evolution. But since no one cares what I call this talk, I'm going to call it the death of language. Um, and uh, what I mean is not about uh, language death, not as in um, the uh, minority language uh, going extinct, but the idea that the concept of language uh, in studies of language evolution should die, that uh, there's no such thing as language, which is a difficult subject to give a talk on. Um, but uh, you'll, see, you'll see what I mean. Uh, in a minute. So in this in this talk, um, I'm going to be mainly asking this question: uh, How many languages do you speak? Uh, so, uh, you, how many languages do you speak? One. Okay, good. So that, that's a that's a clear answer. <coughs> so I was nice, you know, confident about that that number, a single digit, discrete kind of thing. But I'm going to suggest this is a, in fact a difficult question uh, to answer because languages are evolved and they're dynamic and they're context sensitive. Um, and therefore, we shouldn't model languages as fixed, uh, monolithic things. And I'll sort of explain what I mean uh, by that in a minute. And sort of interspersed by talking about these, I'm going to do some, talk about some random studies uh, that I've done. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is this concept called language. Um, you, you have people, and they, they speak, and they produce linguistic variants. Um, and, and we sort of categorize these in two ways. One of the ways is that there's some sort of something called optionality um, between uh, two variants of someone speaking. So you can say the same thing in two ways. But then there's a qualitatively different kind of difference. Um, so if <coughs> one speaker speaks very differently to another speaker, then they're speaking different languages. And the question I'm going to try and answer is, uh, at what point, what amount of variation, uh, if what amount of the difference in variation between two people speaking does there have to be before they're speaking different languages? Um, <coughs> so we have this idea of the sort of different ways of grouping uh, linguistic uh, variation. You have at the very bottom the idiolect, so this is just the, the speech of a single person, um, and then a language, something like English. German, uh, and in between you have something like a dialect of English that might be slightly different. And all the way at the top you've got language families, uh, like Germanic. Um, and <coughs> the question is, how do, how, how do you know that something's um, a, an amount of linguistic variation dis distributed over people is a language and not a dialect um, and not a family? Um, and then you have these sort of other uh, words that also sort of cross cut variation in different ways. Proto language, pigeons, creoles, accents, and uh, just sort of different ways of categorizing linguistics.
linguistic variation. And this, this problem of what is a language is very similar to the problem in biology of how to define what a species is. So you have uh, an individual, like a particular dog, which is, has some genes, and then you can say, okay, this is a type of spaniel, and there are spaniels, and then there are species, a species of dog, um, and then a genus, which might include mammals or something. Um, that's not technically true, but <laughs> you sort of get the idea. Um, uh, the question is, how much variation in dogness uh, does there have to be to sort of make it uh, a species? Um, and the trick biologists have used is to go from the bottom up. So they've used analysis of genes. They've said, okay, we're going we're gonna to pretend that the gene is a sort of real unit of analysis, and it's not really that's very quite complicated how uh, genetics works. But they've made a lot of progress by making the simplifying assumption. On the other side, uh, a lot of linguistics has concentrated on language um, as a the, the comparative approach, comparing whole languages to try and understand how linguistic variation works. Um, I'm going to suggest, well, maybe that's not the right way to do things. But it's not really clear what the equivalent of genes for language uh, are. Is it words or phonemes or syntax or bits of syntax? There's no real sort of... Um, agreement. So that's the first sort of indication that there might be a difference between analysing languages and analysing genes. Uh, another difference uh, uh, brought out by bilingualism is this. Uh, so if you have two animals of the same species, they can mate and you get another animal of the same species. Uh, just like if you have two people that speak English, they can have a child and then that child will speak English. Good. Um, but if you have like two animals <laughs> with different species, you don't get their combined properties. Sadly, <laughs> either they won't be able to make at all, or you get a selection of just one set of genes. Whereas with language, um, you can have two people with different languages that can't understand each other and produce a child that understands both, that has sort of both sets of genes. Um, so this is something weird is going on here that's a bit different uh, to how genetics works. Either it is completely different, or we're using the wrong level of analysis. But this thing called a language is not really a real thing. Um, yeah, so like I said, I'm interested in studies of language <coughs> evolution. So of course, I'm not going to argue that there's no such thing as a language for studies of sociolinguistics. And uh, that's a you know, very real thing there. Um, but for language evolution, what we're interested in, in how the structure of language changes um, under two pressures uh, over time. So uh, the language changes to be expressive and to be learned by the next generation. So what you want your language to be complicated enough to express all the meanings uh, that you need, but not too complicated that a child can't learn it. And somewhere between that balance, structure emerges uh, in language over time. That's the sort of working hypothesis. And the, the approach that um, most people have taken to this question is abstract modeling. So using computational models uh, of agents and language to try and work out how this process might work. And one of the assumptions of these models is quite often monolingualism. So they'll only assume, they'll assume that you can only learn one language uh, at a time. And my original question of my PhD was, um, do our conclusions about language evolution change when we allow bilingualism in the model? Um, does bilingualism somehow qualitatively change what happens to language, uh, like I suggested in the last slide? Um, uh, so, this is how, um, this is a sort of simplified idea of how models work uh, at the moment, um, or certainly they used to. Um, so, you have an agent, um, and there are two languages, and he has to pick which language to speak. Um, and these two languages are sort of fixed things, they're eternal, they never change. The only thing that changes is, um, which one the, your agent might pick. And so you might have lots of agents and this will be extended in time and they might prefer one particular language and they might be able to see that three of their friends speak one language and two of their friends speak another one. Um, and most of the time there'll be an assumption that you can only pick one language. Um, but even in the models where you can pick both languages, um, first of all, there's no sort of qualitative change in how agents can use the languages. So if you if you are bilingual, you know you, you can use K 
code switching, that you can express yourself through variation, um, and that's not captured in these models. But the most important thing is, uh, in all of these models, the structure in the language uh, doesn't change. Most of the time, these things will be you know, a one-bit thing, so it'll either be zero or one. Um, and if, we're, if what we're interested in in language evolution is how structure emerges, there's no room for that to happen in these kind of models. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about that. Anyway, that was the original question of my PhD. So step one uh, was to convince people that bilingualism was an important factor um, that uh, you should want to model. Um, so, a bit of audience participation. Uh, can anyone guess roughly uh, what percentage of the USA is bilingual, speaks more than one language? 33. 30. Right, well, it's about, yeah, it's about 18%. Apparently, according to census data, about 18%. This strikes me as a bit low, actually. Uh, how about Canada? 40. 40. 34. Yeah, I kind of sort of tricked you, and I, I double tricked you. Anyway. Uh, all right, European Union? Oh, yeah, we're getting better now. All right, 66%. That's, that's quite high, actually. And China? 90. Oh, damn. <laughs> All right, I should obviously set this slide up in a different way. Um, yeah, so for the, for the countries we have good data on, um, bilingual seem to be a significant proportion. Um, the problem is, for a lot of the countries, for a lot of undeveloped countries, we just don't have census data on uh, what languages people speak. Um, and those countries are actually the most likely to have um, bilingual populations. We don't really know what proportion of the world is bilingual, but it's probably very high. Um, anyway, I basically got stuck on this problem. Uh, how many bilinguals are there in the world for the, for the last two years? I haven't been able to get out of it. Um, so you can say, well, I could just count the number of bilinguals. So, <laughs> yes. I thought. Um, so the, the ethnologue is a, is a catalogue of languages and it lists how many people speak that language. And there's this thing called the Greenberg Diversity Index, which counts for each country how, how diverse the languages are uh, there. So this is sort of proxy for bilingualism. Unfortunately, in the ethnologue, there's no mention of how much overlap there is between people. So you can, you can see that 500 people speak this language, a thousand people speak that language, but there's no information on how many speak <coughs> Um So, uh, so this diversity index, let's work with that, but it's the probability of any two people from the same language community avoiding each other, which is a bit uh, odd. And in, this is a map of the world, and uh, lighter areas are more diverse. Um, but basically what it means is if, if everyone speaks the same language in your country, then the, the diversity index is zero. That makes sense. Uh, if everyone speaks a different language, then the, the diversity index is one. Uh, so you'll always manage to avoid someone who talks the same language as you. Uh, if two languages are spoken by half the population each, that's uh, 0.5. So this makes sense so far. Um, the problem is that this metric assumes that people only speak one language. So if you have a language X spoken by 75% and a language Y spoken by 50%, so 25% speak both, then you get a Greenberg Diversity Index of 0.18. All right, that seems a bit low, but maybe that's all right. But if you have two languages spoken by the entire population, then you get a Greenberg Diversity Index of minus one, which is, supposed, which is outside the range that's supposed to be um, calculated here. Um, so obviously something's going wrong here, that we're not taking into account um, bilingualism. And partially as well, the data is just not good enough to be able to estimate uh, how many people are bilingual. So I was stuck on that for a while. Why was this such a hard problem? Um, what I'm going to do is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through these different measures of how to define a language. So let's assume uh, that we want to know whether languages are real things, whether they're concrete things that we know exist in the world, and so we can put them in our models. I'm going to use all these measures, I'm going to show you what they are, and now I'm going to show you how they don't work um, to, uh, to define a language, that they're all a bit faulty. Um, and it says down here, I have to say, they fail to demarcate a stable notion of what a language is. Uh, so just keep, keep that in mind. Uh, all right, first approach, 
can't we just ask people? So I just asked you how many languages you said one. Good. Uh, surely that's a sort of uh, that's evident that languages are real things and people think they are. Um, what I'm going to do now is a, a live experiment to try and demonstrate that that's not the case. Um, you, well, you're going to see an English, well, uh, a, a word that's going to appear up here, uh, and I want you to say, I want you to answer whether it's it, whether it is an English word. So if you, if you think it's an English word, <coughs> shout yes. If it's not an English word, you shout no. Okay. Now, obviously, I'm going to try and trick you, <laughs> but like, if you just like react with your first um, impression, then it'll just be more fun. Uh, right, ready? One, two, three. Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, good. Fine English word. Uh, one, two, three. No. Right, good. Lots of agreement. This is definitely not an English word. This is a Welsh word, helpfully marked out by orthography of having far too many vowels. Uh, consonants. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, one, two, three. Yes. yes. Okay, yes, another good English word. One, two, three. Yes. <laughs> okay, we're all still, we're all still agreeing. I didn't enjoy that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No. All right, we'll do again a bit more shaky. One, two, three. switching task 
um, where they tried to measure the amount of cognitive uh, effort required for bilinguals to switch from one language to another. And in their stimuli, they said no words were used that existed in both languages. Um, in fact, I found that 22% of the French words uh, appeared in the Brown corpus, which is a corpus of English, apparently. So bureau was one of their words, which is actually a fairly common English word. So the question is, what, was their, um, what were they using to differentiate languages? Were they using a dictionary approach? And would that give you a different answer if, than if you used a corpus approach? Um, so it seems to me that the researchers were sort of assuming that there was a difference between languages and then trying to find a way of measuring it. Um, and this is a sort of a bad scientific method. Really what you want to do is, is measure things until you find a difference and then assume from that that they are different and sort of getting things back to front. Um, in any event, uh, subjective measures seem to be a pretty bad way of uh, sort of defining languages, getting this stable notion uh, of a language. All right, but we might be able to uh, define languages through use. This is a, a, an example from <coughs> Gafaranga, um, who works in Edinburgh University and does a, a course on bilingualism, which I highly, highly recommend. Uh, he studied people who speak Kino Rwanda, which is a language from Rwanda, French, and English. Um, and the speakers in Belgium, and these two speakers are speaking about um, admissions policy. Um, so this is an English translation and uh, they're color-coded for language. I'm just going to read it out. He says, refugees like him, uh, are schools are privé. They are privé, so you must study to pay, uh, pay to study at this university. Hmm. Mekong, he doesn't have money. He has to apply for a bourse from, they call it, local government. <laughs> <laughs> local authority. Well, it's like, it's like a municipality. That's right, it's a municipality. He got a bourse from the municipality. So, um, uh, Gafaranga's point here is that uh, A and B are quite happy switching in, a, in and out of Kino Rwanda and French um, until A forgets the word municipality and has to, to stop to, to ask B for it. And luckily, since they're bilingual, he can switch into English to ask him for the word. Um, so he helps him out, and then the, the conversation carries on. But this, he, Gafaranga says that this, uh, the evidence of a repair strategy in the middle suggests that moving, switching from Kino Rwanda and French to English is a marked thing. So he says there are two mediums here. One is Kino Rwanda and French, and one is English. And the traditional boundaries that we have for languages uh, aren't really respected. And in fact, so this is the cover of his book, uh, where two people are saying, um, this is from one of his uh, recordings, uh, the notion de langue, the, the concept of language, uh, and then the, the woman is saying it disappears, but she's saying it in another language, and that's a demonstration. Um, so the point here is, okay, that might be evidence for two different amounts of variation, two, lang two languages or two mediums, um, but it's dynamic and it's context dependent. So in other parts of the world, Kino Rwanda and French might be considered completely different mediums. Um, and we can't really say for, for sure that French uh, will, will remain a, a single language on its own wherever it goes. It might be subsumed into another. Um, so, can we define languages through use? Well, maybe, but we have to realize that they're dynamic and context sensitive. Uh, one of the most obvious ways of um, defining language is mutual intelligibility. So if I can't understand what you're saying, then you must be speaking another language. So in this case, you imagine four people, and three of them, they can all understand what each other are saying, um, but this person over here, poor guy, can't understand anything that these three people are saying. So you'd say something like, okay, there are two languages, these three people speak one, this guy's speaking another one. Um, so I'm gonna demonstrate a problem with that uh, using this video. Oh, the sound, do we have sound?
Thanks, it's brought his view. What's we complaining about? <laughs> Your position, Mr. Webby, but you can't go around chopping down other people's hedges without permission. Ah, no. Ah, no. Yes, I suppose. All <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So the point there is um, <laughs> who, who understands who. So in this sort of chain, um, each each person understands his neighbour, uh, but this guy at the end doesn't understand this guy. So what? How many languages are, be, is, are being spoken here? Is it just one dialect of English? If so, why can't this under guy understand the other guy? If it's four idiolects, then we may as well just say that there are six billion languages in the world. Uh, if it's a standard version of English and a non-standard version, where do we draw the line um, between the two? Because it's, it's sort of totally graded. And even more confusingly, uh, the old guy seems to understand this guy, <laughs> but this guy can't understand him back. So it's not even directional. Uh, so mutual intelligibility seems like a a bit of a, well, it doesn't seem to work to demarcate a stable notion of language. Um, and actually, you get this problem in biology as well. So there are species, um, species who are able to mate with each other, they're usually considered the same um, species, or organisms that are able to mate. Um, but you sometimes get a chain of organisms, each that can mate with its neighbor, but the opposite end can't mate. So you get this problem as well. And it's not really just a hypothetical problem either. Uh, so the, there are different theories of the Jap Japonic languages, languages from Japan. Uh, some theories say there's just one language with different dialects, and you get other theories that say actually there are 20 languages uh, which are all separate. And so this is a real debate that uh, real linguists have, not just pretend ones. <laughs> <laughs> so mutual intelligibility uh, doesn't work. Um, well, how about typology? Um, so. Uh, as linguists, we have different ways of classifying languages, um, and we might be able to use those classifications to say, okay, if two amounts of variations share the same features, then they're, they're closer together. Um, the first <coughs> problem with this is that it means that Welsh and Zapotec and ancient uh, South American languages are very similar typologically, uh, at least in syntax, so you wouldn't, but you don't really want to say that they're the same language. Um, the other difficulty is that linguistic typologies might be um, biased by our understanding of what a language is. So most, uh, well, most linguistic research has been done on European languages. Um, so we might expect that um, the typologies that we've come up with for those European languages fit European languages well, but they might not fit other languages. Um, so I decided to test this. And in fact, the morphological complexity of a language is correlated with its physical distance from <laughs> Europe. Uh, um, now, so this is a, a point that Dan Dedu brought up. Um, basically, there's, I mean, there's nothing linguistic in this. It's just the further away from Europe you get, the weirder the language looks because the way we have an, an analyzing it is for European languages. Um, and in fact, you can, you can do this correlation for many different points on the, on the Earth. And well, you can't really see that very well. Uh, and come up with this map. Uh, basically, you get uh, red areas here, a very high, highly significant correlation. Um, so you get, well, you can't see it very well at all. So you get an area around Europe uh, where distance is related to morphological complexity. Uh, that seems to support the hypothesis. However, you also get really highly significant areas uh, down in the Pacific and sort of out in the middle of nowhere. I, mean, I can't really think of why a reason for that would be. I think this is partly to do with the fact uh, of how the languages are spaced out uh, in the world. Um, so if you pick a point down here, you're increasing the amount of variance in your sample data. Um, which is so this, this is this, I'm interested in this kind of large scale statistical analysis uh, of language, and this has been used recently uh, to su support many things, but there may be some problems with it. Anyway, typology out can't uh, can't define languages well enough for us, um, so we might not be justified in putting it into a model <coughs> of language evolution. Well, what if we look a bit more something that looks a bit more like language evolution? So. We look at descent. So um, you're all taught that languages are descended from uh, 
ancestor languages, and you have this idea of uh, tree structure, so you have Proto-Indo-European, and then English came from Middle English, from Old English, from Anglo-Frisian, from West Germanic, Germanic. Um, so we'd want to say something like, okay, uh, English and Dutch are different languages because they have different uh, ways of, different descents. Uh, they have different evolutionary histories, or at least just histories. Um, one question here is whether this is tracing the descent of languages or the descent of people. Um, so obviously the two are very combined. Um, in fact, here's a study from John November that uh, shows that you can actually tell uh, what language a person is speaking, or what language a person speaks, just by their genetic data. So this is a map of genetic data, and of all these points are people from Switzerland, uh, and you can see that the people who speak Italian are genetically different from the people that speak German uh, and French. Um, so this is sort of a reasonable, uh, or less quite an interesting uh, uh, evidence that language and genes are sort of tied, both the sense. Uh, the same. But it doesn't have to be like this. Um, and in fact, so I did a study of uh, individual English words, so the, the descent of individual words coming into English. Um, and I did this by going to the Etymology Online Dictionary, the Dictionary of Etymology, and you have entries like this. So the word pace in English came from the Old French, uh, which originally came from Latin uh, and then from Indo-European before that. Um, so using this, you can sort of draw a, a little graph that this word came from proto indo European to Latin to Old French to Modern English. Uh, and then what you can do is take another one. Uh, so this word acacia, um, that came from the Greek, sorry, from the Latin to the Greek, um, and then into Modern English. Is that what it says? Yeah. All right, so you get this sort of tree. Um, so now you, you can build up a network of all the different descents of the, the words in English. Uh, and already it's not looking terribly tree-like. Um, but then you do it for a few thousand words, uh, and you get this graph, um, which is terribly complicated. But you have uh, modern English over here. <coughs> Basically what you're seeing, red lines indicate um, borrowings between languages. Um, and if this was a tree-like thing, what you should be seeing is a tree structure um, with all the things coming into English. But in fact, there are words being borrowed between languages in all kinds of ways. There are the descent of words, is, they don't just follow one stream, there's all kinds of things going on here. Um, so, I, I just read a paper today actually that argues completely against this. It says the amount of horizontal transmission, the amount of borrowing between languages, is, uh, is actually a lot lower than you would expect, and low enough to make the assumption that there is none. Um, but they, they do it for very small scale languages. For bigger languages, it might be different. Anyway, so this seems to be um, <coughs> no evidence at all that um, languages are real things that you can easily draw a, a line around. But maybe we can use this graph to, to somehow get a higher level category or something. So, um, you can use something called network modularity, uh, which is a computer algorithm that you steal off the internet, which splits the graph to maximize the number of links uh, within a cluster. Uh, and then you get this graph, which is the same graph, uh, but now it's uh, colored uh, into three clusters. So this, this has, the program has determined that these are the three significant clusters uh, in this graph. And it's done a really nice job of separating things into Germanic languages in red and Romance languages uh, in green. And then you have a sort of another category for other languages. So this has done a fairly good job. Just out of uh, raw, low-level data, you can get a high-level categorization <coughs> that agrees with the kinds of things linguists talk about. Uh, the problem is, I told uh, this graph to come up with three categories. So I could have just as easily told it to come up with six categories and it would have done it and it would have looked a bit different. Um, so what's the most you know, appropriate level? And the other thing is, if we have this much data about words, why not just use words in our model? Why bother with higher level categories if we can use things that we know are real? 
Um, all right, so defining languages through descent, tricky. Um, but maybe we're thinking sort of too high level about this. Uh, maybe it's time to get our hands dirty and, and do some real science. Um, if you're a bit squeamish, then you should probably look away now, because uh, I'm going to show you a picture of a brain. <laughs> this is someone's brain. You can't really see that very well. <laughs> on, my, on my screen, is like completely vivid and awful. <laughs> anyway. um, so this is, this is a person, a uh, patient who's undergone brain surgery. And before they did, uh, they mapped out the, p the patient's brain uh, to find languages, uh, areas that controlled languages. And they did this by cutting the, the top of their head open while they were still awake um, and getting them to read um, uh, a list of words in a particular language. Then they took a, uh, an electric uh, an electrode and they poked the brain in, in different bits. Um, and if, if an electric current caused them to stop speaking, then they, you li they literally got a piece of sticky bit and like, put a big uh, <laughs> L on it. So what you're saying here is uh, parts of the brain uh, labeled N, so they're normal. Parts of the brain labeled L, they cause trouble uh, for, for language. Um, and this is the same patient, but if you test them in French, there's this area that's marked out uh, by the dotted line that causes trouble, um, and this area that doesn't cause trouble in French. But if you do that in Spanish, the areas are flipped. So there's this area that, um, that affects Spanish, but not French. Uh, and again, over here, there's an area that affects French, but not Spanish. So we, here we have a double dissociation between brain areas for different languages. So surely this is good evidence um, that, that there is a real concrete thing called languages, called a language. Um, um, unfortunately, if you look closer at this kind of literature, what strikes you is the individual differences. So th this, these are the same thing for many patients, and you can't really see this uh, very clearly, but basically the, um, the different regions that different people have that affect only one language um, are very different for different people. And you even have this person here who speaks four languages, and one area of the brain is, uh, controls English, and the, uh, the other area controls all the other three languages. Um, so first of all, you don't really understand how brains work. Um, and just poke, poking something with an electrode, <laughs> God knows what that's doing. Um, so there are a lot of individual differences. And also, if we're trying to figure out how many languages someone speaks, we can't just open up everybody's brain. <laughs> it, just, it just takes too long. Um, <laughs> there are other uh, so physiology, can we use that to define languages? Well, maybe, but why not just use lower level um, categories like words or syntax or something? Um, why have this big abstract category called language where there seems to be so much difference uh, between people? All right, final way I'm going to talk about is this idea of proper function. Um, this is a sort of philosophical term. But basically, different languages <coughs> might have adapted to different linguistic niches. So just like a biological species, you might say there are two different species because one is adapted for uh, a water environment and one is adapted to live in the trees. Um, you might be able to do that for language as well. A uh, bit of a controversial claim, but still. Uh, here are two languages and two flags of the countries uh, that the language is in. So in Belize, you have this flag, and it has, uh, well it has, it has 12 colors on the flag. Uh, and in this language, there are uh, about 10, uh, 10 words for language. Uh, there are 10 words for color. So there are 10 basic color words in this language, and the flag has 12 uh, colors on it. And this flag only has two colors on it, uh, and the language uh, only has three basic color terms. So is there a correlation between this? Well, there are loads of, kind of, loads of data on the internet. I love doing these kind of studies. <laughs> and in fact, yes, the number of colors in a language predicts the number of colors on the flag. Um, so there's something here. The language is adapt Either the language is adapting to be able to communicate um, the, the colors that you want to talk about. If you want to agree what color should go on the flag, you need words for it. Um, or it could be the other way around. Anyway, um, so this is a sort of argument that maybe you can tell languages apart by their function. Um, but it's a pretty bad argument. I just put it in because, again, it's funny. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> a, much more, a much better study is this study by Lupian and Dale, uh, which was done last year, where the, they found a relationship between the morphological complexity of the language uh, and the, the population of that language. So you get languages like English, which have very big populations, and it's spoken all over the world, has a lot of contact, and a lot of second language speakers. Uh, it's relatively simple in terms of morphology. And then you get languages like Welsh, which are spoken by a small number of people in a small region, um, although rapidly expanding. Um, and they have a, a very complicated morphology. Um, so there, Lupian and Dale's theory is that bigger languages are more likely to have more second language speakers. Um, so adult, adult learners of this language. And adults find morphology difficult to learn, or at least more difficult than children by some counts. Um, so the idea is that English has adapted um, to fit the cognitive niche of its learners. So its learners aren't able to learn morphology, therefore they're not going to pass that on. Uh, and the level of uh, the, the complexity of the morphology is going to decrease. So just like um, biological adaptation, languages are adapting uh, to the population as well. I think this is a really interesting idea. Um, so I did some work on it to try and find what the mechanism might be. And now we go back to silly studies. Um, <laughs> so there's this distinction between procedural and declarative memory that might underlie this difference between child and adult speakers, according to uh, Ullman. Um, so procedural memory helps you do procedural things like uh, running, walking, things like that. And declarative memory, um, procedural memory also does morphology, apparently. Uh, and then declarative memory is sort of looking up uh, words. It's like lexical reference. Um, so procedural stuff for morpho morphological languages and declarative stuff for simpler languages. Um, so if that's the case, could you see differences in languages based on other differences uh, in procedural and declarative memory? So females are better at declarative tasks. Um, and in fact, if you look at the male-female ratio uh, of a country and its morphological complexity, you get a uh, significant correlation. Um, unfortunately, it's the opposite way around to what you would really like. It, the hope was that uh, having more females in the population would, uh, would give you a simpler language, or maybe the opposite. Anyway, that didn't work. Um, so I looked at siestas. So <laughs> daytime naps improve procedural memory. So maybe in countries where people take daytime naps, you'll be able to see a difference in the language. Um, and in fact, you can. This is significant. Uh, the, the countries where you take siestas have a lower morphological complexity than countries where you don't. Um, unfortunately, this is the wrong way around again uh, from what the theory would predict, which is unfortunate, but sort of interesting. Um, and the third one I did was on alcohol consumption. So the amount of alcohol you, the alcohol affects procedural memory, but not declarative memory. And in fact, the amount of alcohol uh, that you drink affects whether you have an inflectional future. So if, if you have a past tense, sorry, future tense, uh, it, it's, in some languages it's inflected morphologically, and in some languages it's um, lexically defined, like in English, so you have I will go, that kind of thing. Uh, and if there's a significant correlation. And this is the right way around. So uh, alcohol predicts uh, morphological complexity. Um, <laughs> no, I wouldn't trust this. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's sort of an interesting way that you might be able to tell the difference between languages based on these um, social factors. Uh, however, so me and my colleague James Winters uh, have been working on a paper that argues that it's really fun nowadays to do these sort of uh, large-scale statistical analysis. And I really enjoy doing them because there's loads of data out there. It's really easy to get. You can just pull them in, do a correlation. It's sort of interesting immediately. Um, the problem is that you can't just... So Lupian and Dale's study is really interesting. They ask a question, why, why is there a difference between uh, languages? Um, but you can't just keep doing statistical analyses of the same data um, to prove that point. At some point, you have to do an experiment. And they take ages. And they're really complicated. And they never work. Um, <laughs> so I don't do them. Um, but at least the linguistic niche, so this is their idea that languages adapt to different linguistic niches, even that is sort of made up from 
many different concepts. It's not just a single thing, so it depends on the population size, uh, maybe the sex ratio, or how much alcohol they drink, how much contact they have with other languages, and uh, things like this. So even though you might be able to use um, um, this method to tell the difference between languages, um, lower level mechanisms will do it just as well for you. So why not just use the lower level mechanism? Uh, so proper function, it might still work, but we still have to admit that languages are dynamic things. They're not fixed. They can change over time, just like English has time. Okay, so here's my conclusion. There's no such thing as a language. Um, that is, there's no easy way to group linguistic variation into a high level category. Although we're sort of taught this, that um, we do an analysis of English versus German, and that's been very productive for linguistics. Um, for evolutionary linguistics, uh, I am arguing that the analysis has to be uh, low level, uh, has to be, be dynamic, the languages have to be able to change their structure, it has to be speaker orientated, you have to take into account that these languages are actually being spoken by individual people, and that one person can speak two languages, um, it has to be context dependent, um, and it has to be an emergent property. So languages in a good model of uh, language evolution should emerge rather than being fixed in by the, um, by the person who's built the model. And this sort of really splits um, the field into two approaches. The first approach, which I uh, characterized at the start, was that you encode discrete languages um, and language-specific biases in your model, and then see how they compete for speakers. So you had the two languages and the, the agent that had to decide which one to speak. Um, but the opposite approach is to take a bottom-up or sort of psychological approach where you look at, in your model, you encode low-level variation, so say words or phonemes, and general uh, learning biases, not language-specific ones. Um, and then you ask how do higher-level categories, something like a language, uh, how do they emerge through use and transmission? So now we're studying um, not just the, how the proportions of linguistic variants change over time, but also how their structure changes over time. Uh, I think that's the, the way forward. And this is the work I'm trying to uh, work on now.